Welcome to episode 48 of the Sourcing Challenge Show. I'm your host, Mark Lundgren. On this episode, I sat down with one of the original sources that I remember under European markets, Martin Lee, and asked him how he got started in sourcing. Well, I think, I think like a lot of people, I kind of fell into it, you know, I'd, um, uh, actually 20, April, 2020 marks my 21st year in recruitment. I started mid April, 1999. Um, and I'd been, I'd been traveling with my best mate. I'd been to, I'd, I'd been living in Cape town actually for a year. And I came back, I think we had like 20 pounds between us <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, thought, right, okay, we need to do a job. And, and there was an advert for recruiters. And I think there was a picture of a Porsche and like earn 100K a year. And I just thought, well, it will do, you know, until I find something proper to do. Uh, so I started in, a, in an IT uh, contract only agency in April 99. And it was a real boiler room environment you know I, I remember having a, a piece of paper where you have to write down your decision maker calls you have to do 40 in a day but I learned I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the environment actually it was it was it was good banter it, it was good fun it was I mean it was hard work but you know massive staff turnover of people coming in it just couldn't handle it but I mean I, I would spend 99% of my time on the phone trying to get through to decision makers and basically ask them have they got any contract jobs to work on <laughs> and that's kind of uh, you know why I, why I got disillusioned with sales in a way and, and why sourcing was attractive to me but I, I, I always remember when I did eventually get a job you know like here's a live requirement I, I realized that time was, a, was of the essence in terms of you know I've got I've got probably an hour or two to send a CV before one of my competitors does, because if they're giving it to me, they're going to give it to anybody. You know, I wasn't on any PSL or anything. It was just, it was just flying by the seat of my pants, really. Um, and we had a, I always remember the database we had, it was something called ISIS. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so I'd get a job and I need a project manager to implement this software in a telco environment. Of course, you just put the keywords in, you know, project manager and speech marks and then, implemented as a word and then the name of the software and of course I was finding those words on a profile and I thought it must be better than this that this system must be cleverer than this and and nobody had really looked into how the system works and I remember going to the ops manager and saying look do we have a manual of this database of how it works and I was given this like boof, this big book <laughs> you know this big book of here here it is and I eventually got through to what we would call operators and um, I, I quickly found out that we had a bit like the around operator in, in Google, you could put brackets and a number. So I could, I could be much more specific with my searches. I could put uh, implement and I could stem the word. So I didn't have to write implemented. I could put implement star and it would give me implemented, implementing, uh, implementation, etc within two or three words of the software within so many words of telco or the name of the telco company and, and my results went through the roof just by uh, reading that manual and nobody else seemed to be doing that and I, <laughs> that was kind of like the first you know i need to open my eyes if, if, if i've got this one opportunity to fill these jobs and everybody's doing things the same way then if i learn this system then i'm going to be better and I'm going to fill more jobs than, than other people. And that was kind of like my first inkling of, of <clears throat> what sourcing is. I mean, I was very much a recruiter, you know, it was just kind of business development and trying to get these jobs. But then like everyone else in, in that environment and certainly around the, the, the late nineties and early two thousands, we were all 360 degrees, you know, <laughs> and, um, and, and, the, and the, the second kind of light bulb moment I had was, um, I think at the year 2000, 2001, uh, one of my uh, biggest customers was Dell Computers. They gave me a requirement because, you know, the nature of contract work was that we'd always get the really tough jobs, you know, because if you couldn't fill them permanent, we'd give them to you a contract. And they get, uh, Dell gave me this job and I still remember the spec to these days, to this day, it was uh, rapid, uh, rapid application clusters, rack on Linux um, and 10G Oracle database, you know, to, to build this thing. 
and of course I'd you know I, I got this job and it was you know big money you know sort of 500 pound a day 600 pound a day big big money at the time and of course I'd gone through the whole database just by putting in the keywords and I, I didn't get one hit with all of them <laughs> I can have you know somebody with two or or one one but the wrong version of Linux and 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 I, I remember those days. You remember the big fat monitors? Well, you're probably too young, Mark. But we, we no, had no, big... no. That's like <laughs> my my primary school had computers. That was still the orange and green screens. Yeah. So that that's how we learned typing rather than on a typewriter. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm still old enough to remember those. <laughs> right. Okay. So so we didn't have we didn't have internet on on our on our desktop. You know, we we had we had database and we had advertising. That there were our two primary sources of, of of getting candidates. But in the corner of um, this big open plan office was this machine under a cover, <laughs> which was the internet machine. And, uh, you know, you'd lift the cover off and a load of dust would come off and, you know, nobody used this, this incident. But I thought, I'm going to, I'm going to just put these terms into the internet just to see, just to see what comes up because I've got to fill this job, you know. And um, so I, I, I put the terms in after 10 minutes of the machine whirring up and warming itself up and... Dialing up. Yeah. What it, <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, whatever the search engine was at the time, and this is probably pre, around about when Google was launched, I think. So probably Alta Vista or something like that. Yeah, something like that. That's um, where we started. Yeah. And so I put, I put these terms in, and um, the, one of the first hits I got was, uh, was a book. And I thought, well, it must be like an advert. But then I actually looked at what the book was, and it was building rapid application clusters on Linux. It, and I thought, right, well, I'm going to click it. So I clicked it, and it was a book written by these two guys, and I still remember their names to, to this day. Uh, Julian Dyke and Steve Shaw wrote, wrote this book. So then I thought, well, that's amazing. So then I went back to my database, to my desk, and put their two names into um, our, our, our actual database. And, and, of course, I found... Julian Dyke, and there's his mobile number because he sent his CV in eight years ago. <laughs> um, but you know, he's he didn't have any hits because he's not updated his CV. Why should he? He's working now, and kind of that was another lesson, you know. Um, so I phoned Julian Dyke, and and I thought it was actually a wind up by other recruiters in my office. I thought they've set me up here, you know. But I phoned Julian Dyke. I said, you know, it's, it's like half past seven at night or something. I said, you know, sorry to bother you so late, but are you the guy that wrote this book? And he said, yeah. And I said, look, I've got this job with Dell Computers. It's a 12-month contract. It's a subject matter expert. It's, he said, oh, that's really interesting. He says, but I'm, I'm working. Um, and he said, but you might want to talk to Steve Shaw. So, <laughs> so I've, and I had Steve Shaw's details on the database as well, again, without the right hits. I've never, I've never found him by just put, by putting in the key terms into the database. And so I phoned Steve Shaw and uh, we had an interesting discussion and it looked like the perfect job for him. And, and I went home really happy, you know, because he was going to send me his CV. Unfortunately, there's no happy ending to that story because Steve Shaw took another job after four interviews. They flew him out to Texas. He was the perfect guy. Um, and he ended up working for Intel. And if you look at him on LinkedIn now, you see that he's still at Intel. So I'm pleased with Steve Shaw. He made the right <laughs> choice, um, but it was it was a real light bulb moment for me. Thinking if I'm if I'm so blinkered to think there's my database and then I can advertise and these are my only taught two sources of finding candidates and then all of a sudden there's this machine in the corner that's got this whole other wealth of information out there. I've got to learn how to use the internet. No, especially finding two people who literally wrote the book of what you were looking for. Yeah. But, you know, that didn't say anywhere. Yeah, they literally wrote the book. And, um, and that, that kind of excited me that, that um, there was this whole other new world to recruitment, you know, this whole other world to not being on the phone all day and people telling you to go away. That, that maybe I could specialize in in um in in sourcing but you know i i carried on within within the agency for a while um and then i got kind of towards the back end of 
I stayed with the agency for 11 years, which I think was quite oh, unusual. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly with that agency. Uh, and, anything more than one year is unusual. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> but I, you know, I thoroughly enjoyed it and, and I met some great people, made some, made some good friends. And, but towards the back end of um, my time there, the, uh, the boss of the company, who was, uh, he was, he was quite um, a, a clever guy, quite innovative guy. He, he started playing around with, um, with data uh, he looked at um, he looked at the CVs that we had on the database, so about 150,000 IT contractors in the UK, and he built a, a kind of a Google Maps front end and, and plotted geographically um, the CVs onto this map. So we we looked at kind of heat maps, mm -hmm. um, so we could see the M4 corridor. Anyone in the UK will know that the M4 is just a east to west motorway where most of the big tech companies go. So you know. There's all the Oracle DBAs along the, the M4 corridor. Um, and, and he said, you know, what do you think? And I said, well, really interesting. But the next question is, where's the jobs? And he said, yeah, it's exactly what I was thinking. Um, so then we started to build scrapers. So we would, um, we built, we built a, not just me, there was a whole development team, but, but I was involved with it. And, and we, we built, um, scrapers to, to extract jobs from companies websites so if all the oracle dbas are there and then there's a load of oracle dba jobs there then you know why are companies hiring in that location when actually the skills are there and all the other questions that you can think of um, so that got me interested in data and what you could do if you could visualize stuff and, and i love the idea that he put it on a map you know, because because it just as a human it makes more sense, right? You know, you can you can see where these things are. So I we got really into that, and about two thousand and nine, he he said, right, I want you to go and learn properly how to find out candidate, how to find candidates, because we want to populate this system with much more than one hundred and fifty thousand UK IT contractors alone. So he sent he said go to a conference. So I went to uh, True London two second ever true London and um, with my kind of the, the product was called Zoob so I went there with my kind of salesman Zoob hat on <laughs> and and what I saw just amazed me and it was kind of like a, like a turning point like right this is it I've got to get into sourcing because uh, Jim Stroud was presenting you know he was he was um I never forget the guy's entrance. You know, he came he came into the room with his suit on, and everyone else had hoodies on, and he was a real, he was a real showman. You know, he was a real kind of um, uh, star in a way. And it, the, the talk he gave was brilliant. Such enthusiasm, and you know, the, the only the way that Jim Stroud can deliver something. Um, and Marie Journey was there. She she presented um, she presented a, a session on on tools. On this tool does this, and that tool does that. And I just thought, wow, just, just, like, I came home with like three pages of written, <laughs> written notes of all these tools and stuff. And I bugged them. I think I bugged Jim and I think I bugged Marie Journey. God bless her. And, and, and she was so kind that she responded and said, oh, well, there's this tool and there's, you know, just go and check them out. And she gave me a list. I remember her sending me an email and it was entitled Virtual Cupcakes. This was all like her best her best tools and she was really kind with her knowledge and, and her time and um, so I kind of uh, at that point I thought I've got to get into this more you know I, I've done you know quite a quite a few years of being on the phone and business development but this is a whole new world within mm -hmm. within recruitment and if there's all these tools that these guys know there's probably a load of other tools that that are out there and if I can adapt these tools to what I need them for I'm going to be a much better recruiter um and sourcing seemed just like more fun right <laughs> much more fun than the than the schmoozing salesy side to it so so yeah that was it that's how i got kind of into it really a number of those di different different events and it just kind of inspired me to to want to know more you know and i think that's the secret so you can't force people to be a sourcer they, they have to be they have to be interested in it and yeah. they have to be enthused by it initially and then they'll go out and find stuff out like I did, you know, and, and I bugged people and, uh, but people were nice back. And I was, I always remember that now, you know, when people, 
request stuff from me or you know how do I do this and I was I always take the time to to answer them and point them in the direction of you know go and have a look here and yeah because in those days we didn't really have I mean you know, the amount of YouTube videos and all your stuff and your guests and, and so many other people no there's nothing there it's it's like that small crowd of yeah people who showed up for the true events and you know the few conferences that was there yeah that's it but we didn't have it then you know so um, but I had great fun looking at these tools and then trying to adapt it to to what I was doing and but I, I got I got really into the research side as well I mean that was another thing which always which always really interested me in that after I left uh, that agency and, and, and that time and I'm still friends with with all those guys but after that I kind, of, I kind of thought well you know what, what is research is that is that even a smarter way of doing things you know instead of instead of real-time recruiting you know if you think about how most companies recruit these days a job is created because of a need you know there's a growth or, or something happens and then we as sources or recruiters will get the job and we have to fill the job real time you know we need that person within the next month or two or three so we're always trying to find people that are interested and in looking around now and i always thought maybe research is the smarter way of doing that you know if, you know why aren't we looking at um, people that are suitable why aren't we working on them now you know, if you try and take somebody out of google or apple and, and offer them a oh. job now you know they've, they've unless got... the timing is right then yeah you're not yeah. going to get them but if you already know who they are they know who you are and you know when it's most likely that the timing is right then you're in a completely different league that's right you kind of you know it's kind of luck it's a luck thing and i don't like luck I, you know <laughs> I, I, I prefer to be smart about things so so i really got into the research side of things and ended up doing um uh, research projects for companies that well there was loads i had loads of great examples of companies you know right, we're thinking of moving there was one company that should remain nameless but they will um they had all their most expensive uh, front office operations they had finance was in malmo in sweden <laughs> Uh, they had IT in San Francisco, and I think they had another, another one in London. So they couldn't have picked any more expensive <laughs> cities if they tried, you know. And they and they came to us and said, um, we're thinking of moving all front office operations to Eastern Europe. But we're not just going to jump and do it. You know, we need to have a bit of a bit of insight. So, th so the research project was to identify the skills that they had, identify people in those countries, ask them what they think of the, the company as a brand would they mm -hmm. work for them and we did the whole thing and, and they eventually moved it and they saved 66 it was two-thirds savings um by actually just moving that and i kind of love that um recruitment related research work you know it, um but it's kind of a business decision thing as well no it's the whole heat map like going back to the heat maps and finding yeah. out like where are the rather than just you know taking the plunge and then like all right let's give these vec to every agency yeah. in that new country actually having the research and saying are these people here and if they are what would they cost and would they even want to work for us yeah no exactly yeah i i, I really got into that um and uh, you know i i continue to do research stuff now i I, lo I love the research work i'm a i'm a committee member of uh, an organization called the era the executive research association so these are about 200 people around the world who are mostly work from home independent people who they tend to do the hard work for exec search firms yep. they're the people that the exec search guys go to when they want to create a long list um, so I do some training with those guys and, and they, they get involved with interesting stuff but I still love to do the research work mm -hmm. as well and I mean I know you you've you let research both for for talent works and and uh, Kelly services so when when you're looking for people, like either it's whether it's a completely new researcher or a sourcer coming in, like what do you look for, and and how do you kind of get them started in in the work? I, I never have a, I never have a predefined idea of what somebody should be. You know, I think I think that's a mistake. You know, I, I've hired people who've been um, librarians. Mm -hmm. You know, because they've got that kind of research, that kind of methodical mindset. 
of right this is what we need to do kind of the way i i always look at things and let's break it down to what tools could be used where these people need to go how do we extract that information what's the best way of doing it you know all the, all the different processes somebody somebody who has a methodical mindset of how they're going to tackle the problem so they could literally come from any background um and, and they don't they certainly wouldn't have to be experienced in it you know i, I one of the greatest things I've ever done, I think, is to is to nurture people. Yeah. Is to, to kind of people who are young and green but enthusiastic, you know, and to and to see them develop their own skills and challenge you and say, well, I think we could do this better, and you know, just um, so I'd never have a, a preconceived concept of where they should come from. I could normally tell by meeting them or or talking to them fairly quickly if they were the right sort of person you know by the kind of questions they asked or or if i was to ever do training sessions with people i was i would always look for the people who were two questions ahead you know um they were thinking about things and and how they could apply it to their situation you know um because i think i think as sources we can we can be a bit robotic with with mm -hmm. what we do you know and, and a lot of people maybe would not enjoy the job but they take a job description they copy and paste the keywords they go to linkedin repeat you know and, and that's just boring that's that's not fun that's that's mm -hmm. not that's not proper sourcing and as we all know that can be automated now yeah um so i always want people who kind of think out the box and who would go and uh, lift that dust cover off the internet machine whatever that may be the, the kind of the way i did so but yeah and i mean normally there would be people who are maybe done a university course they've done their own research or they're technically minded or you know they pick things up quickly or they're just kind of smart smart and inquisitive i guess mm -hmm. to summarize yeah and i know from a lot of people in in eastern europe uh specifically ukraine a lot of them credit you um from kind of having having put the idea in their head of what sourcing actually is and that it's it's more than you know just like somewhere you start in your career and yeah. you could actually continue your career just doing that. Uh, tell us a bit about, yeah, kind of your training and, and you know, specifically you've done a lot in, in Eastern Europe and how you kind of seen their skills evolve over the years. Yeah, I, I seem to get invited back to Eastern Europe, um, but it's a great place to go. I mean, I love I love Kiev and, I, and I, I've spent some time in Russia. I love Russia and the, the people there. I, I do find them, they're super smart. You know, if you, if you talk about an audience where they're two questions ahead, they're Ukraine and Russia and Eastern Europe, um, you know, Bratislava and Poland and other places I've been to, they're, they're, they're smart, you know. Um, I, I always get the impression, and certainly in some countries like that, that they're a little bit told on what they have to do. So they're a little bit restricted, maybe sometimes in creativity. Yeah. So whenever I whenever I talk, I always try and encourage them to be creative within their limits of, of what they, you know if they're yeah. working for a company. But I always try and get them to challenge a bit what they're doing, and, and that's certainly that's certainly the case when it comes to candidate outreach. You know, um, don't just send a job description. Don't be that subject line which is another thirty in the inbox. You know, think about it. Um, so, you know, the, the, the training I, I've done there has always been, yeah, certainly here's the tools and the techniques and here's how you do this and here's the sites and here's how you look within those sites, here's, here's how you extract the information, but, but kind of think about the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. um, if you were a candidate, how would you respond? You know, what, what would be a good approach? And I, I, I remember um, speaking in, uh, in Kiev, um, to a load of, they were pure tech recruiters. I mean, I think it's 98% tech recruiters in Ukraine, you know. Uh, and we were talking about, it was just kind of an open discussion and, and um, they just gave examples and, and they, they love to see the Western examples in Eastern Europe of, of, of what we're doing in the West. And they adapt it to their own market. You know, I, I never think we should copy somebody no. exactly. I, I think some American methods are not right for here in the UK and I always think you need to tailor it to what you're doing and who your audience is but uh, we, we were just talking about um, uh, people going to certain meetups mm -hmm. and there was an example of um, an agency I, I knew in London that sponsored a meetup for, for tech developers and just paid for the beer and the pizza yeah 
and, and it may only cost a couple, couple hundred pounds, but I think virtually every jaw dropped in the room because they just thought, oh, that's, that's great. You know, I was trying to give that kind of thing so that they go away and think about things. It doesn't have to cost a lot of money, but it's just, it's just being creative. And I heard Hung Lee talking about this in Berlin as well. He's talking about uh, inbound sourcing. You know, we're, we're, we all learn all these tips and tricks of how to go out. But actually, there's another way of doing it is to be open and transparent and bring people in yep. your company. Um, but by releasing the right sort of information and creating these communities and, and just being really transparent about things. And I'm, I always remember that I think one of the Jim Stroud stories was when he was at Microsoft and, and he was trying to recruit for support guys in, in Canada. And he was just messaging loads of people and they were replying saying, well, you know, is, is it for Xbox? Is it for this? Is it for anything really sexy? And he would go, no. <laughs> but then Jim just took his iPhone and just walked around this um, this um, support center and just interviewed people with, with his, it cost him nothing. Yeah. And I think it's still one of the top videos on YouTube of working at Microsoft is Jim with his iPhone, you know, and it's just, it's just being creative and just thinking, you know, what's the object, what's people's objections here? And it's just that they don't know about it. So I'm just going to get my iPhone out and I'm going to interview people. Yeah. No, I think creativity within sourcing is so important and we shouldn't be robotic about it and we should have fun with it. And you started your career very much kind of looking at tools and the tool stack. Uh, what does your tool stack look like today then, Martin? Uh, it's probably cut down a lot since, <laughs> <clears throat> since a few years ago. You know, I, I think I went mad. Um, I mean, I, I, I've got, looking at my big screen now, I've got a big raft of extensions up there. I think it, I think it's good to have an arsenal of tools, but I uh, I definitely think it's important not to have magpie syndrome in terms of, you know, I'm just going to have every tool because you just sit there playing with stuff and you don't get any work done. Um, <clears throat> but if you if I think about what tools do I, or what do I pay for? Mm -hmm. What paid tools do I actually have? I have LinkedIn Recruiter. I have Amazing Hiring. Um, I have an Indeed subscription which maybe some sources wouldn't admit to having <laughs> things like that. But I, yeah. I, I learned a big lesson um, with Indeed. I was, I was recruiting for a role which was really niche. It was selling specific medical equipment into mm -hmm. hospitals for, for surgery. And um, I think there was a free trial with Indeed. And, and I just thought, well, I have a look. You know, I know how to go big and wide and Google and everything else. I know how to do this stuff, but but I shouldn't be um, arrogant and dismiss job boards. You know, I shouldn't have the attitude that the people in there are not going to be any good. And I just found this woman who was absolutely perfect. She had all the keywords. It was just such a simple, easy search. I just put them in and there she was. And then I looked at her LinkedIn and it was, she said, customer services, two connections and her university. And that was it. You know, so it doesn't matter what LinkedIn license you have. You wouldn't find that that woman, no. um, and she's still there. She's loving it, and 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 it's great. So um, I, that was another lesson in that we shouldn't um, dismiss these these other things as well. Um, and you know, even even if it's a case of using Indeed as a research tool, not necessarily hiring from. You know, which companies are doing which projects? You know, what's the email format? Uh, all these sorts of things you can use as well. Not plus, but, people tend to overshare when it comes to their CVs. It's like yeah. where, where they know not to share publicly what their clients are and things like that on LinkedIn. When it comes to CV, I've seen some you know, management consultants go into very much details. Um, most of the time, short of actually mentioning the name of the client, they, they've, <laughs> they've done every piece of what their project with them were. Yeah. But you don't get that on LinkedIn necessarily, um, mm. but you do get that a lot of CVs. And you know, with Indeed and, and a lot of the other CV databases, people tend to forget they put their CVs on there when they stop getting emails. Yeah. Um, so even going back and saying, like, show me every CV from ever and then taking the oldest first, because, yeah, similar to your, your people writing the book, you sometimes get people that are like, yeah, this isn't anywhere on any of your social profiles, but here you describe a project which is exactly what yeah. might be five years ago. And, you yeah. know, I don't know if you've updated it, but I have a mobile number, I have an email. Yeah. Um, and I have a really good description of you having done this in the past. So yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, it's, it's, I say it's similar to the book one in that, you know, there could be some old information there. And then when you kind of cross-reference, you know, so I'm, I was doing, I'm, I'm working on some tech roles this morning and um, which are really quite niche. And I ended up some weird site, which was, which was about, uh, a paper released about about this particular subject but then you know then I go back in to look at this guy's LinkedIn profile there's nothing on it you know there's nothing on it at all so um, and, I, and that's the fun of it right you know that's the, it's the thrill of the hunt um, for us um, you know it, it might sound a bit crass in, in, in a way but at the end of the day, I, I, I do think we do such an important job. You know, we, we, we put people into the right jobs. We change their lives, you know, we, and we should never f forget that, that we're in the people business. Yeah. And if, if we can enhance people's lives by giving them a better salary or giving them the career aspirations by stalking, yeah. then, um, then, then let's do it, you know, and, but we, we can have fun with it. A lot of people always talk about the big life decisions, like buying a house or buying your first car. Um, and I, I always, I talk to people as well. It's like, well, look, what we do enables people to either do or not do those big life decisions. Look, if we, if you do the wrong decision and, and you know, you, you, yeah. you don't get the right kind of salary, you're going to have to buy a smaller house because you won't get that mortgage. But also what we do, and now I think that comes very much to when you get to a point of you offering somebody a job and not everybody's going to accept it. And recruiters are always like, oh, he took the counter offer or stayed where you were. So, I'm like, well, look at like, this is probably the life's biggest decisions mm -hmm. of whether you change your job. If you have a family to support and a mortgage to pay off, you know, if you make the wrong job decision, that's going to, you know, do everything else is going to get in jeopardy. And mm -hmm. we forget that if it's just thinking of it as an offer that didn't get accepted. Yeah. I mean, I always feel slightly guilty about taking people out because then we've set off another chain of events from the other side. But, um, you know, I think that's down to companies and, and, managers creating the right environments and giving people the right career prospects and yeah. and if they don't then then people should should be uh given the choice of where else to go and, that's and our job is to find those triggers it's like what's going to make somebody consider making a move yeah uh, yeah we have it right now where a lot of people are talking about oh you should look at what the companies are doing with in response to the to the virus outbreak I don't think whether that's necessarily going to make the big difference, but you know, you're definitely going to have a lot of people who's going to be home for a few weeks now that are going yeah. to consider like, what am I going to do? You're going to have a lot of salespeople who now know they're not going to reach their annual target. So they're not going to stick around to bonus time. Yeah. They're going to be more, more interested if, if they can find somewhere else. So yeah, yeah there's going to so. be a lot of kind of different, different interesting things from a sourcing point of view, but we also see a lot of our colleagues kind of being let go because right now nothing is going on for most companies. yeah yeah and it's interesting you know i mean it's super challenging times for everybody in that a lot of the work has been shelved but but for somebody involved in research i've had a couple of approaches for companies who are saying right now is the time for us to map our competitors to understand their salary and benefits to think about our work from home policy and we're going to use this time to position ourselves ready for, for when things go. And, and we've got that knowledge to, to, to approach people. So there's always opportunities, you know, and, and the skills we have as sources are transferable, whether that be, you know, I've seen, I've seen a load of things on LinkedIn, you know, what, what are we meant to do right now? Well, get your house in order, you know, sort your database out, identify people that you know you're going to need make contact with people, network, you know, there's a lot of positive things you can do. Oh, and the similar things like, like switch it around. If you don't have an active search that you're working on because you don't have a job, use those skills to look at who are the companies that I think is going to come out on top from this or yeah. that I always wanted to work for and start networking into them. So, yeah. you know, when things starts looking up again, like you have that network of people that are like, oh, okay, I would really like to work for you. This is my skill set rather yeah. than waiting around and, and waiting for them to, to you know, put a job offer out, then it's just like, look, this is what I can do. I think I can help you. you know, like I know about your company. This is where this is what I would do. I would love yeah. to work for you when it's when you're back up and running. Yeah, um, and look at it like the other way. Like use those skills to actually look for your next gig. Yeah, exactly. It's all transferable. You know, it's. Um, I mean, we've never experienced anything like it, but you know, let, let's make the most of it and, and do, try and do some good. Martin, if people want to stay in contact with you and. Yeah, see where your journey takes you. How can the best do that? 
probably LinkedIn is the best. You know, I'm uh, I'm not difficult to find anyway. But um, there's I'm, I'm I'm everywhere: Twitter, Facebook, and, and and all the usual places. Yeah, connect with me on LinkedIn. Always happy to always happy to talk to people about sourcing. You know, I have a lot of people I have conversations with. People asking me about how do I search for this and search for that. I'm keen to. I always remember that when people helped me at the start and I'm keen to, to help other people. So yeah, connect on LinkedIn and let's chat. Perfect. Thank you very much. And thank you for your time. Pleasure. Thank you, Mark. If you like this episode, please consider sharing it or any of the other episodes with a friend or a colleague who might be interested as well. And consider subscribing to the channel, which will help us meet more people um, and grow the community.